Hello, guys. Um, this is a sub series that I'm creating under Carnival Controversies. So this will be called Raw versus Cooked. And um, this is the first one in, in that sub series. So this one we'll be looking at heterocyclic amines and that are produced when you cook animal foods and so it'll be called pretty much is cooking uh, meat and fish dangerous so you know there's a number of people out there claiming that it is um, claiming that HCA um, when it does increase it's dangerous and causes a lot of damage in the body and it's very unhealthy and stuff like that so we'll look at the, the that claim and we'll look at the aspects as well and uh, what the issues are now anything you cook um, will develop these heterocyclic amines but certain food combinations can cause a bit more than others so that's important, the take-home message. Now, as far as from an evolutionary point of view, we've been cooking meat based on archaeological evidence somewhere between 1.5 million years. So the, the hominins, you know, our past relatives, including our speciation, pretty much have been cooking for a very long time. And we still see tribal people in Africa still cooking the Maasai, and we know they've got longevity people in their tribal groups and a number of others. So even populations like the Koreans, the Sardinians, Costa Ricans, um, the Okinawans and their pig eating, cooked pig eating sort of practices. So pretty much every single modern day and centenarian population consumes cooked animal foods so it just seems that the claims just don't really hold up to logic and observation but we'll look at these claims in a, um, that people like you know especially people if we go back and look at sort of uh, historically there are a number of characters but the ones that most people talk about, or the key one, is Arginus von der Planitz. Um, this guy was, he, 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 I don't, he just made up this name. It's um, uh, sounded snazzy for him, so um, I don't really know. I, somebody had mentioned to me a while back, but it was a very long time, and I just cannot remember the exact story, how his name came about. Um, his actual real name is John um, Swigard. Um, uh, that was his real name, that he was <laughs> his legal name. But uh, he went by this sort of name. And uh, he sort of uh, was very heavily involved in raw food. And we're talking about both plants. So he had like carrot juice things and stuff like that. Meats, raw meats, raw dairy. Um, and... So it was sort of whole food, raw foods type uh, type approach. Um, he was a big campaigner in sort of the um, raw milk um, uh, campaigns of many a moons ago. And that's what he's sort of known in the industry um, primarily about. Uh, I think he was on a, at some stage, this is before he, uh, a number of years before he passed away. Um, he passed away at the age of 66 by falling through a balcony, um, a railing. So he was on one of his properties. I think it may have been in Thailand, but I'm not 100% sure because he did have a property in the Philippines as well. But apparently he fell through a railing um, and but pretty much broke his neck. So, you know, that was the end of him. Uh, from an accident but uh, up until then he was known to be to eat like raw chicken and 
all sorts of things. I think on a TV show, he actually ate raw chicken as well. So he was a character, let's put it that way. And there's a lot of people that still follow him to this day, people like Varys, people like Joey now, um, in particular people um, uh, like Zverige, you know, people like that. So there's a number of these people that actually do still follow him. He's quite popular within um, the raw um, uh, top paleo raw carnivore raw um low carb type environments but even in the sort of populations that actually do other raw type of foods even some of the vagoons actually do mention give him a bit of a mention so it's a it's a quite mixed bag even though he did promote animal a lot of raw animal foods as well so but it's people using his arguments which were never proven. He actually made a lot of claims, but never really provided document documented evidence for those claims. Um, I mean, there may be some truth in some of them. I don't know. Without a record, without, uh, you know, none of us know. We do know that in the human speciations, we've, you know, for very long times, people have consumed both raw and cooked. Um, so that is normal. I mean, even I consume some fermented and and also raw um, animal products, and I have no problems with that. Um, in that, but when people make claims um, that cooked is really bad and all that, they need to provide the evidence to you know to back their arguments. You know, just making claims and throwing a lot of arguments out there um, why it should be the case sort of def um, you know goes against the archaeological evidence and goes against also that all these modern day populations that have a certain, you know, even if let's say the records are not perfect in some countries of these populations, they do live a very long time. So if there was a problem, we would see it manifesting in later life with extreme levels of cancer and other and other sort of conditions. We don't. They die from natural causes. So the, um, the observational studies and the archaeological studies do not provide support for these people like these people are these people's their arguments against cooked meats or cooked animal foods. I will be covering other aspects of cooked versus raw. Um, in terms of digestibility, macros, micros, and stuff like that. So there'll be a, a bit of a deep dive into, into that as well. But at this stage, the focus obviously is primarily on uh, looking at these, what are considered carcinogenic or mutagenic compounds. So let me just share my screen. So this is a review of a lot of the literature out there. It's a Japanese study and looking at heterocyclic amines, mutagenins, carcinogens produced during cooking of meat and fish. So I'm gonna skip. These are the two main ones we wanna we wanna sort of look at. This one and this one. These these two. Uh, that's a 4-8. Uh, they didn't put the numbers in, but anyway. And these two also very similar. It's just slightly, slightly different. Um, you know. So we're compared to this one and this one. So this one is considered sort of the worst in terms of carcinogenicity and mutagenicity. This one sort of comes in probably about close second, and these ones are lesser in that regard. But we'll cover them. Well, they're still, you know, but um, slightly lesser than these ones. We'll still cover them all, and we'll go, but um, so these will be the key ones, that one there and that one there, just to highlight them. Okay, I'm going to give all these rat studies a bit of a miss. 
obviously, you know, these are carcinomas and all that. Now, obviously, they have mega dosed these animals, and that's why they've induced these effects. They were trying to work out how much do you need to give them before their detox pathways just can't can't cope, and then you start getting lesions and stuff like that. So obviously there is a point. So as you can see, they're not giving them compared to the human stuff or what we would use, what we would eat these sort of foods in the 100 grams or whatever you're getting nanogram amounts. These little rats were being given things like milligram amounts, way more. So let's look at this, the amount of heterocyclic amines in cooked foods like we've got salmon, salted fish, bacon, pork, chicken breasts, London broiled steak. Okay, so we'll look at the, um, in, the, in the type of salmon. They've only given us um, grilled. They haven't given us fried or anything else. So this one here is that first one, which is pretty much, it's called 2-amino 1-methyl 6 Fenny um 4.5B um, porridine, and is one of the most abundant heterocyclic amines. So it's one of the, you know, the other ones are much less trace amounts. This is the one that actually you get the biggest amount when you cook animal foods. This one and the other one, the, the second one that we'll look after at in cooked meats, um, PHIP is formed at high temperature. So you have to cook things at high temperature. Okay. For quite some time. It's a bit like the other ones that I did, you know, the PUFA ones, which are covered, you know, where you had to really cook things like for three hours um, to get just a bit of trace amount. And then you had to cook it like for 32 hours before you got even any significant stuff. And it was still lower than what you'd get from any oils. So it just shows you how much you really have to, um, you know, put meat to the blowtorch before you get anything significant in terms of aldehydes and primary secondary oxidative products. There's a, a PUFA series. People can go and check out the playlist and I'll get, I cover all that sort of stuff in that area. But here we'll, we're still focusing on heterocyclic amines are the key one. Now, this one is formed in high temperature and the reaction between creatine, um, creatinine found in muscle in muscle meats, amino acids, and sugar. Got it? So the more sugar you have, the more of this you'll get. It's important. You know, it's not enough to basically have the amino acids. You need the sugar. On a mixed diet, you will have higher amounts of this. On a carnivore diet, which doesn't have a lot of sugar, you're not going to get as much. You simply are not going to get as much. We'll look at the at the data, and, the, and the, it'll become obvious as we look at the data. So this is the other one. I had to use, this is uh, a German Wikipedia page because there is no English one for this for this heterocyclic amine is a chemical group um, of parasitic aromatic hydrocarbons and has been this is has been detected in roast beef, sardines, salmon, generally in cooked foods as a byproduct of browning reaction, which is the Maillard reaction, and in cigarettes and smoke condense condensant. Okay tobacco smoke obviously in these sort of things you're going to get a hell of a lot more um let's put it that way but you don't get as much when it comes to animal foods but that's that second one so we'll just for completeness we'll cover that and the third one is this one here remember when we were looking at there's that one there's that one and then there is this category D mill QX. Okay. So we're going to look at that as well. That's a lesser one. And what, what are they looking at? They're looking at a model um, 
system of fructose, alanine, and creatine. So, you know, so when you hear people in the bodybuilding industry eating a lot of sugar together with creatine and alanine and stuff like that, you know what, guys? Give the sugar a miss. You don't need it. You know, remember, I did a video on leucine covering muscle protein synthesis. Now. Yeah. Okay, so in previous papers, the main mutagen component isolated from the bottle reaction system D fructose, D alanine, and creatine was tentatively identified as 48 D MLQE. Its mutagen activity spectral characteristics has now been compared to those of isomer 58 D MLQE. X and the other one as well, which is the 7, 8. They're all very similar. Um, this finding is in agreement with the hypothesis that sugar... And this study was done back in 85. But subsequent studies, they're all showing the same thing. You need sugar with aminos to create this problem. All these problems... So amino acids, creatine present in meat may be a precursor of the mutagenic imodoquilin and imodazoloquinoxaline 2 amines, which is their scientific name. IQ compounds, we'll call it, making it easy for me. And pretty much even this study here found that you could, the creatine glu, um, glucose, three in sort of combination, or the creatine sugar, so glucose or rib, ribose, and the amino acids, alanine or lysine. So if you combine those, if you combine anything like that, or in this heated creatine, fructose, and alanine, in this other study, which was 1985 as well, but earlier in 1985. So as you can see, the the story here is, we should tell Salad Boy this, Mr. Saladino, when you do combine fructose, my dear, and animal foods, you're going to be basically causing this problem as well as all the others as well. So when you're on a species-appropriate diet, you will be generating far less of this. Let's be quite candid about this. Now, obviously, in the grilled fish of both types, salmon and all that, these are, remember, nanograms. We're not talking about milligrams here. I will show you the information shortly, the amounts, so you understand that nanograms are very, very little in comparison, okay? So... We have got that's in the flesh, obviously. It's going to be higher in the skin for the simple reason that's where you're going to find more um, additional fats, you know. So, and those fats are going to be DHA, EPA, and stuff like that. Obviously, they are more sensitive to heat which makes a bit of a difference, especially in the skin. Again, here, the other one, flesh, very low again. Slightly different, the opposite, when it comes to this one. In the skin, identical. These ones here, this one here is very low, and this one's slightly higher. So as a reference, 88, 88. So you can see that the actual salmon and salted fish is slightly higher, but still, we're talking about 88 nanograms. We're still talking about, um, on average, the sort of reference score, if we're averaging out these sort of numbers. So still quite low. Very low, to be precise. Bacon fried obviously cooked would be less, but you've actually got 30 to 450. Now, why would you have 
thirty to four fifty. Simple. The reason for that is that four fifty and that thirty one is going to be commercial bacon that's actually got included, you know, sugar. Because there is a lot of commercial bacon out there where they'll douse on a bit of sugar. Um, uh, so it'll, it'll yeah, be where there's some smoked and some others that don't have any um, any sugar on them. So you have to look at the labels. So if you're basically consuming, you're going to get very little. Again, the barbecued stuff, again, you know, the barbecue sauces and stuff like that. Again, the same sort of crap that people put on. Just one of those things. Um, grilled chicken breasts surprised me. Much, much higher. But again, you've got this range, which is a, quite a bit of range. So I suspect there is a bit of glucose and, you know, like on the chicken breasts, you, some people put oils and stuff like that. So yeah, it could be stuff like that. It's not they don't provide you know sufficient information. Uh, the London, you know, the stuck steak, London broiled steak, yeah, that's probably without, and that's probably with some sort of um, you know, glue um fructose type thing or some sort of thing that they've put on. Now, when it comes to these, the Miller QX, that one, which is that second one, you know, the hydrocarbon one, what are we looking at? Fish tend to have more. Um, that is pretty much that number, like a minus 22370, some computerized number that come, or, sorry, no, it's not that. I'm mixing myself up. Um, either nothing, nothing traced, not detected, or or quite a bit. Again, I think it's this frying thing that, uh, sorry, the bacon, because you see with the pork, there's basically bugger all. And again, with the barbecue stuff, which they've put the sauce type thing on, that sort of effect. But it seems with the bacon, it actually probably does a, have, has a bigger effect, maybe because it crisps far more than the pork when you cook it. And sort of it adds to the, the problem that if you've got, if it's been to put sugar in, um, in the sort of the processing of that meat, the bacon, to cure it, then it's probably, you know, um, even though it's got less of this, it seems to have more of this because probably they are hydrocarbons. And because hydrocarbons is all that black stuff, and so I suspect because the sugar molecules of those will actually create more of that tarring effect. You know, So that's where it's coming from, where if you get plain bacon you'll have nothing detect hardly anything detected not detectable so i think that there is good grounds based on this to say if you're buying bacon check it take a look at the label really be careful make sure there's no sure even though it's in the nanograms it's very low still but why get it in your system why need to be able to reuse your top antioxidant system, you know, to deal with something when it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to, you should have, you should be getting pretty much non-detectable of these hydrocarbons. So, and it's probably also the amount of cooking that people are doing and stuff like that. There's probably multiple factors for these variations. I wish they'd broken this down a bit more detail, but they haven't. So again, for this one here, all the meats are pretty much, not detected, good, fantastic. And this one, the um, pretty much the steak, non-detected. Um, the chicken breast, non-detected, or the 200. That's probably, again, the same thing. Sort of, what are they putting on it? Um, again, the barbecue stuff is pretty low. 
and the this is again a range when i say a range i know they've done something to it you know because if you've got a range you've put something you've added something to it and that's affected it but as you can see the reference value is much lower for the pork and the chicken um, and the bacon uh, steak is very similar to salmon but they're different ones that are affected in different ways so that's the sort of variations i'll attach these things so people can people can take a look at them but you should consider that when you look at these consider the levels now i have grabbed this now let's look at what these mean to us okay so i got this off um some paleo um, link that I found ages ago. So, so, so this is heterocyclic amines, and these are the two key ones that people talk about. These are the key ones. This is toxicity dose in mice. That's the quantities you need for mice, and that's in the milligram range, guys. Milligram equivalent toxic dose for a large. Per for you know, a slightly above average. Um, I would have preferred 70 kilo person, 154, um, 154 pound, but this is what I got. So, you know, so if we're looking at 154 pound person, and we're looking at these numbers, 5297.2. So it's about four and a half you know, pretty much 4.5 grams. Remember, a thousand milligrams is a gram, one gram. So 4.5 grams is the toxic dose for humans. This is on a mixed diet, even. Let alone on a, if you're on a carnivore diet, you've got an insulin to glucagon ratio 1.3, so you're quite low. You've upregulated your, ant, your ant, inter, intracellular antioxidants like glutathione, catalase, and SOD, superoxide dismutase. So those, let alone, let alone if you're basically earthing yourself and pulling up negative ions, so electrons, remember, what is an antioxidant? An electron donor gives an electron to stabilize something that has lost its electron. So if it's under oxidative stress, any tissue, it's actually lost an electron or more. So these intracellular antioxidant systems do produce these, these things that can stabilize tissue. But to get to the toxic levels where it could become a problem for human health, you really need these sort of levels. So we'll go on an average person of 70 kilos um obviously somebody like uh, you know that's quite large like dr sean baker he would be in the five to six because he's actually um much larger he's over six foot you know so he's a big lad and so he's got far more tissue so he could actually go even higher than this so we're just going to go for the average so 4.5 grams four and a half grams for a 154 pound person for this one and for the other one and i'm doing this just so because some people are going to jump up and down and go oh you know always argue and that's pretty much 0.77 of a gram or 770 milligrams so the actual amount in 100 grams of Real chicken breast is these in terms of the nano, um, the milligrams. So these are not in nanograms that we're looking in the other one. So these are conversions. This is linked, this is related to that study because I found the same study linked. So these tables, somebody actually has calculated these tables. Um, I checked one of the figures, they seem to be fine. Um, uh, and actually, I also checked the other figure over here. So now, 
So that's for that. That's this is fried bacon. As you can see, the bacon is even less than uh, this is fried bacon. Remember, it's less than the grilled chicken. And this one here is um, broiled steak, 100 grams. They're all 100 grams, which is 3.53 ounces. Three and a half ounces, 3.53 to be more precise. But look at this in terms of milligrams. Look at the difference. Massive. Obviously, for this one here, which is the hydrocarbon ones, um, steak is the lowest. Then you've basically got um, chicken being the lowest, and then you've got bacon being slightly more. Understandable, because we all love to overcook our bacon and make it crispy, and we get a bit of a burn char around it, don't we? We all love that. Some people do it slightly more than others <laughs> but you know but still compared to the toxic levels and this is the average person here if we pretty much divide that by 0 0.00237 we are talking about the difference between the toxic level for 100 grams toxic level now let's say we go for a kilo so that's 10 times that's 2.2 pounds. We'll divide that by 10. Okay, because it's 100. So still, you would have to consume as a carnival to get to the toxic levels for this one here, hydrocarbon ones. You'd have to basically 32,489 times so we're talking about, you know, from kilos, 32,000. We're talking about, you know, like 32 and a half tons. Now, unless you're a boat, a big um, boat that can actually carry that sort of stuff, the likelihood you will ever get to these toxic levels would only be in your weirdest dreams. In reality, it would never happen because... 32,500 fold is like, you know, having a kilo of steak or having a truck, not a, even more than a truckload. We're talking about a lot of stuff. We're talking about, you know, 32 pound, um, tons. Now, yeah, 32 tons would be quite a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, do they have trucks that big? Not sure, but it'd be a, a quite a lot. It would be physically impossible for a human to consume that amount per day. It just wouldn't be possible. So it's beyond any possibility, okay? So it's just nonsense. Now let's look at the, I'm always looking at the worst. So we're not going to look at the bacon. We're not going to look at the grill. We'll look at the beef for the actual um, heterocyclic amines, the, 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 that, that major one, the PHIP. So we'll do that as well. That's about what it was in comparison. So divide that by 0 0.0182, and then we'll divide that by 10. So that would be equivalent to nearly 25 tonnes or the equivalent of somebody having, and I mean, I don't even consume that amount. Somebody like a young person who's doing bodybuilding or somebody like um, Dr. Sean Baker, he probably does consume like well over well over two, um, two pounds per day. But m most of the rest of us, you know, would struggle. I'm always way below that unless... Um, I'm going to do a lot of physical activity on that day and then I'll have a big feast. But otherwise, it's usually way be below um, that level. It's even way below, you know, one pound to be completely candid. So even, but even if you were to consume um, that, to get to these sort of levels, you would have to consume like 20, 
4,725 plus fold, fold, you know, so we're talking about a, a sizable truckload or if not more, um, you know, we're talking about very large vehicles like those mining vehicles. I think they can actually manage these quite a few tons. I'm not sure whether they can manage this amount of tonnage or a small ship. We're talking about a lot of vast amounts to get to toxic levels. And this is per day having this, eating this every day, which would be physically impossible for any human. So you're never going to get to these high levels. So it's a non-issue. You're not even going to get anywhere close to toxic levels. You know, vast differences. And this is why we need to ignore rat studies, because in rats, they give them concentrated. They don't give them the food. They actually give them these compounds, but in vast amounts. So unless somebody was actually every day getting a truckload of these, these um, molecules, bring it to his factory, extracting these things, and then putting them in a water and, and gulping them, you know, in a couple of glasses of water, gulping them, unless somebody was doing that because they were, I don't know, crazy, they wanted to kill themselves, they're not going to get into toxic levels. It's just physically impossible. As you can see, it's just nonsense. Because otherwise, we wouldn't observe the things that we observe. We would see, you know, these populations that live, that primarily cook, they don't consume raw foods, these centenarians, they would not be getting to those ages, not even close. Even if we were to say, well, maybe that 10 years out, they're not going to be higher than that. Even if they were 10 years out and rather than dying at 100 and something, they were dying in 90 something. That's a long stint on the planet Earth. That's a long stint. And these people are consuming cooked animal foods. So it makes no sense. Absolutely no sense. There are arguments that, uh, you know, heterocyclic amines and hydrocarbons and stuff like that um, that are produced by cooking. And we're talking about quite a bit of cooking here to get those to those levels. And so the sort of these are milligram ranges that we're looking at here. And we know in some cases you can get down to the, we're looking at, in the previous stuff, we'll look at the nanograms in very small amounts that actually exist. And these, and these are the highest amounts in milligrams, which nothing. And we're talking about grilled, fried, you know. I was quite surprised with this one here. When I looked, I can understand the, the hydrocarbons because that, that tarring, you know, you'll get more of that from bacon. So I could only understand that, but I was quite shocked at how low this one was, which is considered one of the worst. This one was in comparison to beef and chicken. Very low. Piggy won out on that one, hands down. And on this one, basically um, beef. And it takes a bit. It's probably the reason for the beef is because it's got a higher water content, more moisture. And I suspect that's what's actually preventing giving a better result for beef, you know, the water content in there. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's still not a big, not a big issue. The take-home message is that... If, whatever diet you're on, it's a non-issue. Cooked meat in terms of heterocyclic amines and hydrocarbons, non-issue whatsoever. It's people taking rat studies, which are mega-dosed as molecules being given in their water or whatever. They're not given in food. They're actually given or sometimes even injected this stuff in these mega-doses. Yeah, obviously, you know, if I was to give you 
cyanide in high amounts. Small amounts, you could probably tolerate it. High amounts would kill you immediately. You know? Really? You know? It's just a joke. But this is the reductionist nonsense. I'm not against the researchers. The researchers are just doing to try and work out what are the, the toxic dosages? What levels do you have to get to kill or cause an injury or harm to a specific organism? That's fine. That's a mechanistic study where you're trying to work out. Where I get annoyed is when people then try to make an issue of it, extrapolate from that, especially we're talking about vagoonerized nutritionists and the other nutritionists out there that have sold their soul to the food industry that then use that data to try and beat up you know, an anti-meat agenda or whatever else, or even cooked food agenda um, for the more extreme elements out there. You know, that's when they take that and they actually try and make an issue of it. There is an, there's no issue. The levels are so small in terms of toxicity. Our bodies, even somebody on a standard diet, can deal with them. People on a standard diet only have to concern themselves with de high deuterium foods or high um, oxidative primary, secondary oxidative products and aldehydes from their seed oils and their refined sugars. That's what they should concern themselves more about, you know, and less con concern about these. And when you're on a carnival diet, you're getting less sugar intake because these levels are calculated when they're looking at the humans. It's really calculated from and from what? Mixed diets where you've got sugar and all that. That's what they find that those amounts. So if you're on a species appropriate diet, it's a non-issue. And there are advantages that future videos will explain advantages in having cooked food, cooked animal foods in particular. So I will leave it at that. That's the first in this sub-series. I hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, see you.